Hello, everyone. I'm Danielle Deswert Hahn. I'm the head of music programs at the National Gallery. I am here today to tell you all about the music department at the National Gallery of Art. And um, if you came hoping for a little musical performance, well, today's your lucky day because I'm really not a lecturer, I'm a performer. So the concerts at the National Gallery started almost from the very beginning. It's the very first public program that happened at the gallery. Um, the gallery opened its doors in March of 1941. You may know that we recently celebrated our 75th anniversary, and around that time, David Finley, the original director of the gallery, noticed that at the National Gallery in London, Dame Myra Hess, who was a renowned pianist, classical pianist, had started a series of public concerts at the National Gallery in London while their collection was off the walls um, during, during the war and during the Blitz, and she felt that there needed to be a place for people to come and experience culture in a time and a place like that. So that's what she did, and David Finley modeled our first concerts after that, and I actually have here from the archives of the National Gallery the very first press release for the very, very first concert. Through the generosity of a Mrs. Matthew John Whittall, the National Gallery of Art will present in the lecture hall on the ground floor, this is before this building existed, in uh, a concert by the Budapest String Quartet at 3.30 p.m. on Sunday, May 31st, 1942. This concert has been planned for men in the service and their friends. The program will last approximately one hour the selections to be played have been popular on other programs given by this internationally famous quartet. Servicemen attending this concert are urged to be prompt since the doors of the lecture hall will be closed as soon as the concert begins. Members of the public will be permitted to take all unoccupied seats after the performance of the first number. So the concerts were begun for servicemen who were stationed in Washington. And um, shortly after, David Finley started doing these concerts. He felt that with all of his other activities as the director of the museum that he really couldn't continue to plan concerts. So, I have another article here. <laughs> um, he found a young man by the name of Richard Bales. And Richard Bales was a conductor and a composer and he was actually a colleague or a classmate really of Leonard Bernstein at Tanglewood um, in the summer of 1941. And so um, in, around that time, Richard, uh, sorry, David Finley asked Richard Bales to come and be the director of music here at the gallery. And so um, I have here a New York Times article on the eve of Richard Bales' retirement in 1984, 42 years later. It was the early summer of 1943 and the nation was at war. As men and women in uniform scrambled for seats in the serenely beautiful East Garden Court of the National Gallery of Art, 28-year-old Richard Bales raised his baton and a Washington institution was born. The uniforms have long since been packed away, but Sunday night another audience will be on hand in the East Garden Court when 69-year-old Richard Bales begins his 42nd year as maestro of the gallery's free Sunday evening concerts. I guess I'm like the man who came to dinner, Mr. Bale said recently as he sat near the fountain in the palm-studded East Garden Court. The idea was that when the war was over, the music would stop, but it's just gone on and on. I'm the luckiest man alive. So for 42 years, Richard Bales programmed a 10-month series of concerts, and the first concert of every month was an orchestra concert, and the orchestra was uh, usually comprised of what would become the National Symphony Orchestra. Um, but now I'm gonna take a little break for a musical interlude because Bales was, as I mentioned, uh, a friend of Leonard Bernstein, and over the next two years, um, there are going to be an, an international celebration of Bernstein's centennial. So I thought that my colleague and friend over here, Ben Wenzel, and I would, would give you a little, little bit of Bernstein. Uh, this is the first meditation from Bernstein's Mass. <laughs> Thank you. 
So Richard Bales began an American music festival here, which uh, was something that was continued annually. Um, in the last couple of years, we haven't done it so much anymore because American music has really become part of our, our regular repertoire here, I guess. It's, we don't really need to focus so much on it, but at the time, 75 years ago, uh, it, was, it was really kind of rare for there to be a lot of um, American music performed. Um, Richard Bales had the opportunity to premiere Charles Ives' first symphony here in 1953. Uh, there was really quite a long tradition of, of uh, bringing American music, lots of commissions, lots of world premieres, um, and Bales himself composed um, music as well. He was a Revolutionary War aficionado, so he wrote cantatas, and, and those were performed frequently. This is Richard Bales conducting for an opening of an exhibition, and that's actually in a gallery. So the Sunday concerts, by and large, they used to take place in the East Garden Court and the West Garden Court. As many of you may know, we occasionally present in here. When Richard Bales retired after 42 years, the next person who was appointed by then director Carter Brown was George Manos. George Manos was similar to his predecessor, a conductor, a composer, and a very well-known pianist around the area. He had been the president's pianist. He wrote a book, My Term with Truman and My Life in Music, in which there is a chapter about his work here at the gallery. George Manos did, he expanded a lot of the programming here to include, he formed resident ensembles, including a gallery string quartet, a gallery uh, vocal ensemble, and that gave them the opportunity to produce more, more things that were sort of uh, unique to, to the gallery. Occasionally there would be things in honor of exhibitions, but by and large, it was a very traditional classical concert series. They took place at 7 o'clock on Sunday evenings. Um, and George Manos was here until 2004. During that time, George Manos also brought jazz to the gallery. So he started to incorporate jazz programming largely in the American music festivals, but also, you know, regular, a lot of times at the holidays. This was the McCoy Tyner Trio, and you may recognize Stephen Ackert, who was the person who took over after George Manos retired in 2004. Stephen, unlike Mr. Manos and Mr. Bales, was not a conductor and a composer, and during Stephen's tenure here as head of the department, he really shifted a lot of what happened uh, in the concerts of the gallery. While we still had the National Gallery of Art Orchestra, we always had to have a guest conductor. As Mr. Manos mentions in his chapter on his book here, the price of a union orchestra about quadrupled in the 20 years that he was in charge of the orchestra. So during the 90s and the early 2000s, the orchestra would be presented about four times a season and always with a guest conductor. Stephen kept up some of the traditions that had previously been done here like the traditional Viennese New Year concert. But he really brought in a lot more programming that tied in with what else was going on around the gallery. He organized a lot more concerts in honor of exhibitions. He began midweek concert series, uh, which was a great way to be able to have staff who's not usually here on Sundays, so their staff would come to the concerts, people around the mall. Stephen started collaborating a lot more with other organizations around town with embassies, um, and a lot more with the gallery's educational programs. So uh, that, was, that was really something that expanded the programming here during Stephen's period. Actually, this was sort of during the period uh, in between when George Manos left and Stephen took over. Um, the 2500th concert uh, took place at the National Gallery of Art. So that was in 2004. Stephen stayed at the gallery until uh, 2014, which also happened to be the year that Richard Bales would have turned 100. So one of the last concerts that Stephen programmed here was a concert in honor of Richard Bales, where uh, we brought in an orchestra and a choir to perform uh, Bales' cantatas, The Union and the Confederacy, and they were performed by, um, by the orchestra. 
The new mission of the music department here is to serve the gallery's mission by presenting innovative and diverse public performances that build community and also maintaining the standard of excellence upon which the gallery is founded. So while we still have a very high level of standards of the performances that take place here, there is more to the story now. We are telling other people's stories. We're telling the stories of people who weren't around 75 years ago. We have a new community. We no longer have servicemen in uniform, but we have a completely different community who we serve. And we're right here on the mall, and all of our programs are free. And we want to represent a lot of different voices and a lot of different styles. And we want to bring a lot of people here to help them foster understanding of the art through public performances. So now I'm going to move into the next portion, which is a sneak preview of our 2017-18 season here of concerts. Our very first opening concert of the season, uh, I'm going to introduce my friend and colleague here, Jennifer Cho, who is the uh, executive director of the New York Opera Society. During Stephen's tenure, we did premiere several operas in collaboration with the New York Opera Society uh, by this composer, Gisela Kvernadok, who's a Norwegian composer. And our opening event of the 1718 season is the weekend of September 23rd and 24th, in which we're going to host the New York Opera Society in a presentation of a new opera by him called Letters from Ruth. And as you can see, it's based on Ruth Meyer's diary, a young Jewish girl's life under Nazism. And so we're going to have a two-day forum on Saturday. Uh, the, the composer and the librettist will talk, and then on Sunday we'll present in the West Garden Court that story. And it's going to be really excellent. So that starts in September. October. Once again, the only presenter in Washington who will have Curtis on tour. We have them twice in the season, so our October 1st performance is with Curtis on tour. We're collaborating with TEDx Mid-Atlantic and the Canales Project to tell the stories of uh, three artists who were featured here, Laura Downs, Sandeep Das, and Kaoru Watanabe. And that'll be on October 8th. We have the Dali Quartet with a percussionist doing a Latin program, and Voices of the Ocean features cellist Matt Heimovitz and violinist Lena Bon with stories about water conservation with some new commissions, and it's going to also be with um, electronics. And then we have Pomerium on October 29th, and they're going to do a concert in honor of uh, an exhibition, Bosch de Blomert. In November, we bring the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. They're playing two-string octets. And The Crossing is um, a contemporary uh, choir from Philadelphia. And they're bringing a program called uh, National Anthems. And it features David Lang's National Anthems and uh, some, some works by Caroline Shaw and Ted Hearn, some contemporary composers. And Mantra Percussion is going to bring a piece called Timber um, that's going to celebrate the opening of the Jackson Pollock mural. On Thanksgiving weekend, for all of your guests in town, we have programs on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday that are all in celebration of the exhibition Fragonard's Fantasy Figures. And again, on Sunday, we'll feature the New York Opera Society. And on the Friday and Saturday, we're going to do some pop-up concerts that will be a la salons that would have been um, had in, in Paris uh, during the period when Fragonard was painting his fantasy figures. Fragonard had relationships with Beaumarchais, who wrote the plays uh, Marriage of Figaro, Barber of Seville, and there were a lot of connections with costumes. So we're going to have a lot of fun that weekend uh, doing some excerpts from all those operas. And today I have some friends with me who are going to sing a song. This is from The Marriage of Figaro. Thank you, Danielle, for having us. We're thrilled to be here. Um, just a little introduction about what we're going to do. I'm sure it'll be familiar to many of you, perhaps from Shawshank Redemption. Um, it's featured in the prison yard scene where Morgan Freeman broadcasts it. But it actually is a duettino from the Nozze di Figaro, which is the second uh, 
in, in Beaumarchais' uh, Figaro trilogy, The Marriage of Figaro. And in this, the Contessa, uh, played by Michelle, is going to actually dictate to her servant, Susanna, a love letter to Michelle, to the Contessa's husband. She knows that the, the Count has been unfortunately um, trying to seduce her maid, and so she's going to trick him by having her, her maid write a letter to her husband to meet her in the garden. Of course, it, will, it won't come to pass that way. So I'm not a conductor or a composer, but uh, before I started working here at the gallery, I was an opera pianist. So I have a lot of famous friends. And I don't think I introduced Michelle. Michelle Guttrick. Oh, sorry, Michelle Kober. OK. So please come on uh, that weekend. Bring your family who are visiting. Um, I'm sure lots of people have visitors on Thanksgiving weekend. And you'll get a lot more, and there will be costumes, and it'll be very fancy. <laughs> in December, we have uh, we open December with Ina Follix and Daniel Schlossberg playing Forehand Mahler. On December 10th, we have the Swiss American Musical Society. They're going to do uh, Stravinsky's L'Histoire de Soldat with Robert Baker narrating, and they're also going to play a composition for the same instrumentation by uh, Christoph Sturzneger, uh, also called the Snow Queen, and he's a, a Swiss composer. Uh, and then we have our holiday concert is the Turtle Island String Quartet with Liz Carroll. It's going to be a Celtic holiday. And of course, uh, we keep the tradition of the caroling in the rotunda, the two middle weekends of December um, on Saturday and Sunday. So you can come and sing Christmas carols with the National Presbyterian School Chorus, the Army Chorus, uh, the Metropolitan uh, Church Singers and Ringers, and the Centennial High School Madrigals. Then we take a break, because Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve are Sundays, so we're not going to work on those days. Um, in January, we are bringing back the Viennese uh, New Year tradition with the Eclipse Chamber Orchestra. That's going to be on Friday afternoon, January 5th at 3 o'clock. 
And then on that Sunday, we have the Harlem Symphony Orchestra coming all the way from Harlem. Uh, Finnish pianist Juho Pojonen is going to play um, a traditional piano recital. It's going to be fantastic. P. Faro, the Renaissance band, will play. That's going to be the closing day of the Vermeer exhibition. And so they're going to do a concert. Uh, the Vermeer exhibition has many pieces in it that feature instruments and people playing instruments and people singing and performing. So, so that's, there's a lot of great connections there with the art. And then on January 28th, Cyberite 5, which is a string quintet uh, that plays kind of contemporary music, they're going to open the show, they're going to play an opening day of the show Outliers, um, which, opens, which opens for three months on that day, I believe. In February, we've got Daniel Bernard Rumain, uh, also known as DBR. He's playing uh, with a pianist. They're doing um, a concert called Redemption Songs and Sonatas. And then we have Curtis on tour again in a Bernstein concert. Trio Cumbrio Copenhagen uh, is going to play uh, some, some uh, Danish pieces. And cellist Narek Heknazarian will play a recital. In March, we've got Ethel doing uh, a piece called The Blue Dress. It's some contemporary string quartets. Janoska Ensemble, they are uh, a quartet of, of uh, performers from the Vienna Philharmonic who play just crazy gypsy, chardash, fun music. So that's going to be really great. And then Benedetto Lupo is going to play a concert. It's, it's actually uh, the 100th anniversary of Debussy's death, also we have a French exhibition opening on that day, and he's going to play an all WC concert. April, we have Richard and Mika Stoltzman. Uh, Richard, the famous clarinetist, and his wife is a marimba player, and they have a new thing that they're doing with, with a lot of duos. It's really fun. Uh, the Hinevanker Ensemble from Estonia will do some ancient Estonian runic tunes in honor of the Michael Sitto exhibition that, that is open at that time. Fretwork, the viol ensemble from England, is going to play Bach's Art of the Fugue. On April 22nd, we have Inkscape Chamber Orchestra. They're going to play Carnival of the Animals, and I've commissioned new verses by spoken word artist Mark Bamuthi Joseph. So that's going to be something really unique and fun. And on the second half, they're going to play Mahler IV uh, chamber version. And in honor of Saint Sans, Carnival of the Animals, we're going to play a piece that you might recognize.
That brings us to our last month of the season, which is May. And uh, we have just three concerts in May. Uh, Julia Bullock, who's a very, very up and coming, very hard to get. It's taken me a few years to get her. Uh, so that was that will be worth the wait. She's going to come on uh, May 6th. And on May 13th, we have the Ranky Tanky Band, which is a Gullah band. Uh, they, are be, they will be playing in honor also of Outliers, which features some Gullah artists. Um, and on May 20th, Christina and Michelle Naughton, uh, they're a piano duo. They're twins, if you couldn't tell. And that is our season. Since I have two fabulous singers here, and since we have a nice French show going on right now over in the West Building, uh, my friends have very kindly agreed to grace us with one more song apiece each.
Thank you. 